there we go. Let's start that over again. All right. I'm going to say again, it kind of pains me to make this presentation because I'm a big proponent of people contributing to the Canada Pension Plan uh, to the greatest extent possible and then waiting as late as possible to start their Canada Pension Plan. I think for the vast majority of financial planning clients, that is the right decision. I'm going to present some information here that's going to maybe counter my typical view on this. And I don't know if anybody happens to follow me on Twitter, but if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that I'm currently engaged in a discussion where I'm very much speaking in favor of uh, participating in the Canada Pension Plan. So we're going to talk about uh, just the we're going to ground a little bit of where CPP will be in 2025. And I'll talk about why that is in a second. And then I'm going to show some uh, life cycle of uh, the business owner with respect to Canada Pension Plan. And I'm going to show three different scenarios that might uh, that our business owner might go through. Okay. Um, in no way are these comprehensive. I've really this, unfortunately, with a presentation like this, um, everything is so very case specific. Like any good financial planning question, uh, this is always going to come down to um, it depends. So it always, always, always depends. Okay. So the Canada Pension Plan um, in 2025 now, why did I settle on 2025 here? And yeah, sorry, Sean, I see your question here. So let's talk about that. Sean says he sees a lot of salary recommended to the minimum of the year's maximum pensionable earnings. So in this case, that would be, I guess, 691 or maybe 78774 of salary. Um, and then, um, yeah, Sean says he's seen more dividend only lately. So that's kind of where I want to land here, Sean, is just the answer to that question. I hope that by the time we're done the presentation, you have a little bit more ammunition to answer that question. I don't think there's one right answer. Okay. So by 2025, when most of what we see as far as changes to the Canada Pension Plan have taken effect, this is roughly where we're going to land. Everything on here is a little bit approximate. Um, we don't know exactly these details, obviously, yet. There's a bunch of uncertainty here, but I essentially built this with a 2.5% um, annual growth in YMPE in mind. It might be a little high. Maybe I could use 2%. doesn't really matter. Um, inflation is inflation. Easy for me to say. So we're going to end up with a year's maximum pensionable earnings at about $69,100. That's where we're contributing the 5.95% rate that we'll land at for Canada Pension Plan. And then we're going to have the year's adjusted maximum pensionable earnings, which is going to be 114% of YMPE. That's the extra portion on which we'll be contributing that we're not yet contributing on. That's going to be a 4% contribution rate, assuming no changes. So the idea here is you'd be contributing 5.95% up to that 69.1, and then 4% between 69.1 and 78.444. That'll break down then into a tax credible contribution of $3,250, and then tax deductible contributions of right around $1,100 for a total cost for the employee who is earning at the max of about $4,290, and then the employer match of another $4,290. And this to me, um, always surprising when I look at it, that's going to put us at about an $8,580 cost for that small business owner who is participating in a Canada Pension Plan. Now, I was kind of hoping uh, Jason Pereira would be here because I know Jason likes to make the comment that maybe we shouldn't really look on the 4290 as a cost, and it's not all cost. You get something back for this. It's not like this is a tax where the money is gone. So in no means do I want to make an argument here that this is wasted money or anything like that. In fact, quite the opposite. Okay, But it is going to be more expensive. If we look at even this year, we're about a $6,000 um, cost of participating in, sorry, last year, about a $6,000 cost of participating in the CPP. Okay. 
So I want to think about this then in the context of the life cycle of the business owner. I've introduced a business owner, Tina, okay? And Tina at 30 has a at least a moderately successful small business, enough of a small business that she's paying herself enough to pay the bills that she could switch over to dividend only, okay? She has two young children. She's married. Her spouse is about her age. Okay. So if she stops paying into the Canada pension plan, if she says, I'm not going to take salary anymore, and I'm going to switch over to a all dividend or mostly dividend strategy, you might do $3,500 of salary. I know I've seen that sometimes where you pay a, a bare minimum amount of salary so that there's clearly an employment relationship. So she doesn't pay then roughly in 2025, $8,580 in Canada Pension Plan premiums. She's going to reduce her CPP retirement, her eventual CPP retirement by about $425.73 um, per year. Okay? So that's about a $425 uh, sort of reduction in her CPP as a trade-off for not participating. She can then save with that $8,580 set aside, okay, she can save about $47,000. Now that assumes a 5% rate of return. I didn't get into taxes and inflation too much here. I tried to keep everything sort of level. We'll talk about inflation in a moment. I do have a specific comment around that. Okay. Oh, and Sorry, Rob. So you're exactly right, Rob. There's a relevance here to um, RSP contributions because if we go to all dividend strategy, you're of course foregoing the RSP, right? I think that's the point here, Rob. So if you're going to go with an all dividend strategy, it also means that you're foregoing RSP or IPP or whatever other kind of registered savings. I think that's where your question is pointing, Rob. Now, this makes a lot of assumptions, okay, this uh, 47,327, um, but I did some fairly basic time value of money around this. The Excel spreadsheet I already put in the chat box. You can maybe pull it from there. I'll post it again when I'm done. So you want to pull it and double check my numbers or run your own numbers or whatever, you're welcome to do so. So, yeah, great. We can do better quote unquote, better by investing. But to me, this really ignores a large amount of the benefit we get out of participating in the Canada Pension Plan. And for Tina at age 30, I really have some concerns here. First off, I don't know what everybody else's experience with this is, but I find a lot of small business owners, not annually, Paul, sorry, one time, just that that's a one time. You're right, Paul. If it was 85, 80 a year, I just am isolating out one year, okay? So if she, sorry, Paul's right here. I wasn't clear on this point. If she doesn't pay just at age 30, that saves her 8580. That would reduce her eventual CPP benefit by 425 bucks a year. And she would save that 47,327. So Paul, you could add the next figure for next year and the next figure for the year after that and the next figure for the year after that. Fair? Oh, that makes sense. Thanks, Paul. Good question. Okay. so. The and as usual, Paul is not you missing something, it's me missing something. All right. Um, so what I would consider here is that I see a ton of small business owners and especially younger small business owners where they haven't got their risk management all in check. We talked about this in the well, what session was it where the point came up about uh our uh doctors not having uh, personal directors, for example, personal directives, for example. Well, same thing here. Lots of business owners who don't have disability insurance or who have inadequate disability insurance. So I would look at whether or not that disability insurance is there. And what I actually have here, this present value of these disability benefits, that doesn't actually take into account Tina's own disability benefit from CPP. That's only for the kids. So that 85,462 is the present value. If Tina becomes disabled today of a disability benefit for two kids, for the purpose of this math, I assume she either has group benefits with a CPP offset or an individual disability policy with a CPP offset. Okay. 
Yeah, sorry, the chat, there's no uh, chat really. I don't know, S. Sanders, sorry. It's The questions are showing up in the um, Q&A and I've tried to address the questions in the answers I've give, been giving because I know not everybody can see them. Okay. So assuming, this assumes that she does have disability insurance. If she doesn't have disability insurance, then the present value of that potential disability benefit is substantially larger. The other thing that she potentially gives up, now ideally it's not both, although you could have both claims, is a death benefit from Canada Pension Plan. That death benefit, see the, uh, sorry, the, the survivor's benefits, I should call it survivor's benefits here. The survivor's benefits have a present value of about $240,000. So if she dies today, her kids are getting about 200 and, add it back here, sorry, about 200, oh, I don't have it on here, so I thought I did. Uh, anyways, about 300 bucks a month in 2025, that'll be about the right amount, so $300 per month per child. And her spouse is collecting a survivor's benefit of, again, around 800 bucks a month, okay? So those are potentially very substantial amounts. Okay, yeah, Andrew, I'll repost them afterwards. I posted them at the beginning of the session, but that's only helpful if everybody was there right at the beginning. So I will repost them again. The other thing to consider is that the 47,327, sure, that sounds good, but to do that, she has to be willing to take investment risk. The CPP benefit is indexed to inflation. It's guaranteed or as close to it as we can reasonably get. And we have... Uh, creditor protection as well. That is, if she has a personal bankruptcy or something goes wrong in the business, her CPP is still there, okay? So to my mind, anyways, if I have Tina as the client, I'm going to lay this out for her and I'm going to suggest that her um, position here should be one that uh, favors risk management. And given the opportunity, I'm going to recommend that she continue paying into the Canada Pension Plan. Okay. If we focus only on what I have in blue and we don't think about any sort of risk, well, then I would suggest that we're maybe not fully contemplating what could go wrong for her. Okay. Does she, so Kyla's question, does she have to be collecting for her children and spouse to receive those benefits? What if she dies at 31? Right, so as long as she pays her premiums, Kyla, the, the criteria to collect, say, as long as she's a regular payer to CPP, then her, uh, you know, if she becomes disabled, then she would get the disability benefit and her kids would get the disability benefit. If she dies, then her spouse would get the benefit. So if she pays in, if 30 is the only year in which she paid, maybe that's your question, Kyla, then no, this doesn't help. She has to have paid in prior years as well. Um, for disability, she has to have contributed in for the past six years. And for uh, survivor benefits, she has to have contributed in one third of her contributory period or 10 years, whichever is less. I think I answered your question, Kyla, but if not, let me know. Okay, so you're right. One year of premiums doesn't get us there. I'm assuming that she has been paying into it to this point, and it's now that we have the question. Okay. Okay, let's fast forward though. We'll fast forward and look at Tina at 50. Okay. Tina at 50 has accumulated assets now. She's done a good job. She's been working with a financial advisor for this whole time. She has who knows, an IPP or RRSP or investments within her corporation, whatever it is. She has proper life and disability insurance, not quite like we heard in the ethics case maybe, but appropriate life and disability insurance. And kids are now obviously quite a bit older. So now, Sorry, Robert. Um, should we subtract off the tax paid on T4 versus dividend income? Right. So, Robert, the um, the math here, and I show this in the, the white paper that's attached here, but the math is that we have the same net amount, right? Integration should see us with the same net amount of dollars available, whether we take dividends or salary when we take into account both, both personal and corporate taxation. Is that the question you're asking, Robert? I'm not sure if that's where we're going or not, but yeah, integration would say that 
it's the same net amount of dollars when we take the entire picture into account. Okay. So if she stops paying into CPP, again, ignoring inflation here. So I've got 20 years with no inflation, but we had to use something. So she doesn't pay $8,580 in CPP premiums. This is going to reduce her CPP retirement benefit again by $425.73. She would save a lot less now. She's only got 15 years if we're assuming an age 65 retirement. So she would save $17,837, funding an additional $910 of annual income. So she does come out further ahead again, just strictly mathematically. Now, again, we take into account investment risk, indexing, guarantees, and creditor protection. However, the big difference here is with her non-retirement risks. So the present value of disability benefits would be substantially less here. She has disability insurance. So really, the only disability benefit would be paid here would be at the maximum for that 23-year-old child, assuming they're still in school, potentially two years of benefits. The uh, death benefit, the survivor's benefits, right? I said uh, death benefits again here. That should be survivor's benefits. The survivor's benefits here would be paid to her spouse. I'm assuming that her spouse is a relatively high income earner and would have his own Canada pension plan. We would defer his Canada pension plan benefits until age 70 to get the maximum out of her survivor benefits and get about $118,000 present value for that death benefit, a lot less than the present value of the survivor benefit we saw back at age 30. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And let me just copy the documents back into the chat box. Andrew, you might see them now. Okay, all right. So I worked through then three possible scenarios. I said, okay, at age 50, her CPP benefit, I would suggest, is less important from a risk management perspective, okay? So there are three, and I just used three. We could obviously have a lot more scenarios, but three possible scenarios we could play around with here. In our first, she's going to go to a 100% uh, dividend compensation structure at starting immediately at age 50, and then start CPP retirement benefits at age 60. And the result of this would be a, uh, okay, yeah, that does happen, Andrew, yeah. So, um, and I'll try, yeah, I'll try and find another way to get them shared maybe in tomorrow's uh, uh, sponsor booth. Andrew, I'll see if I can pull something off there. Um, but the, yeah, the outcome here is going to be, uh, let's call it $770 a month of CPP benefits starting at age 60. Again, ignoring inflation, but that does account for not contributing for 10 more years and a 36% reduction for starting early and putting away. And this, um, Robert, I think this was your question earlier. This is where we do see the impact of 8580 per year for 10 years. That would be about four hundred and or sorry, about four hundred thousand dollars in her pocket at age seventy. Actually, what I have there is the eighty-five eighty contributed um, for uh, twenty years. I apologize, plus the CPP benefit that she starts at age sixty. So, assuming she doesn't need any of that money, she would just be able to save and save and save, or invest, 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 and have four hundred thousand dollars ish at age seventy. In scenario two. She waits a few years. And the reason I did this was because five more years of paying into CPP for her is going to give her five more really good years of contributions. And I wanted to see how that plays out. So here we would increase that benefit by about 120 bucks a month. So bring it up to 886. And she would save around $320,000. Okay. And Finally, in what I would normally prefer, scenario three is the thing that I would normally recommend, but I'm not sure it makes sense here. And that would be that she participates um, in CPP to the fullest and starts collecting benefits at age 70. And here we would have CPP benefits of $2,015.11. 
Now it's possible, and I kind of ignored this, but it's possible that she does stop contributing at age 65 here. And there's a couple different forks in the road at age 65, as I think Alexander can well attest, wherein we can have participation in the post-retirement benefit, or we can opt out altogether and then potentially save that money. So there might be a little bit more to scenario three to get us to a fulsome comparison. Again, though, there's so much uh, fork in the road there that I sort of ignore that and just went with the simplest scenario. Okay. Um, we've got about three minutes for questions. I'll flash my email address up on the screen here. Um, there it is. But uh, yeah, I've got, for what it's worth, if anybody has any um, questions left over, I appreciate the questions while I was going. I hope that I answered them fairly and thoroughly. Otherwise, I'd like to thank everybody very much for your attention. Thanks for coming to um, Financial Planning Week. I think it's such a wonderful event. I always enjoy it. I really enjoyed Megan's presentation today, and I always loved Demian's ethics presentations. So thanks. I see some questions coming in now. All right. Oh, thanks. Um, yes, Sandra, I'll email you about Toronto. All right. Okay. Yeah, Gary, you're right. Um, you're talking, I think Gary says there's no estate benefit, and that's the scenario with three, Gary, that you're pointing out, right? So I agree with you, Gary. Um, yeah, the math was pretty fast. All right, that's fair. Uh, you do have the opportunity to review all the math, okay? So all the math documents are attached in the chat box. Oh, I'm not sure if I... Um... Oh, sorry, Misty. I'm not sure if I follow the question. Oh, okay. So I think, Misty, your question here is about the employee. And my conventional advice with the employee which is different here, right? Tina is not an employee. She's self-employed. My conventional advice with the employee is to participate in CPP as long as possible and to wait as long as possible to start collecting. And that's because it's a, a lot less cost for the employer. The employer picks up a lot of that expense. And the employee just has a lot less ability to manipulate their own circumstances. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, Misty, if that's an answer to your question. I mean, Calvin, that's always the best way to do things. If if Misty or if uh, sorry, if Tina can tell us exactly who, when uh, when she's going to need all the various sources of income, then we're so much better off, aren't we? Okay. And yeah, but Gary, I absolutely agree that there's uh, you know in the third option. I think that's what you're saying here, Gary. In the third option, we just we're uh, we're giving up on. Uh, Sur on meaningful survivor benefits, most likely, okay? Good, or meaningful benefits for the spouse, most likely, okay? So that depends, that's a whole other question. The question here from Singh M9, how long should the employee contribute to CPP? Uh, for somebody who was 18 and went to work at a young age in Canada, probably 65, but again, there's a million variables there. But for somebody who comes to Canada later in life, there's a strong argument to be made that that person should contribute all the way to age 70 because contributions between 65 and 70 replace earlier years on a one-for-one -one basis. Okay. I appreciate it, Misty. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, that's time. So if there are any further questions, you do have my email. And like I said, I'll try and find a way to share this in the sponsor booth. Again, appreciate, oh, anonymous attendee. I'm probably recommending, I don't know. I'm probably recommending scenario uh, number two here, sort of the middle ground scenario. I know that's what Don, Dan Kahneman says I'm supposed to do is recommend the middle ground, right? Um, it still gives us a fairly substantial estate value or dollar amount with which to plan. Um, I'm getting a little bit more monthly benefit out of that CPP. You know, I would want to check what annuities are doing and, and how that plays out, but probably the middle ground here. Okay. Right. In the third option, Sandra, there's probably no survivor's benefit payable uh, because she's married to another, you know, at least modest or higher income earner. So that reduces the likelihood that there's really a survivor's benefit, right? If you are, excuse me, two high income earners married to one another, 
their survivors' benefits um, become irrelevant at least after age 70, okay? There are some things we can do before age 70 to still get those survivors' benefits, but that's it. Okay, I think I have to end there. I think I have to be respectful of everybody's time. So thanks so much, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you.